Could I have the panelists up on the dais, please? Now, a slide up here a moment ago said that the American College of Surgeons have been involved in quality improvement for 100 years. I would challenge that. Actually, surgeons and quality improvement probably goes back to the 1500s and one of the early fathers of surgery, Ambrose Paré. Now, you may not remember or maybe you've never even heard of Ambrose Paré. Ambrose Paré was a French surgeon he wasn't trained in the normal physicians' colleges of France in the 1500s. He rose to be one of the king's physicians, which was very unusual. He's famous for having told the uh, physicians uh, of France when they asked him what his credentials were to be admitted. Uh, he said, well, the battlefield has been my classroom. You remember that Paray started quality improvement with the simple observation that putting a salve, turpentine-based salve, on a field wound did better than pouring hot boiling oil into a field wound. And he began the process of understanding how that subtle change in his procedure, in his process, made a positive difference in the patient's care. He's also famous for examining the difference between burning a wound, an amputation, or as we would say in the medical world, cauterizing an amputation, versus using ligatures, sutures. And he looked and he saw that the patients who had uh, experience with, lig with ligatures may have had a higher infection rate, but they did overall much better. And today, the hemostats that you use in the operating room every day are a result of the quality work and quality improvement that Ambrose Paré began. So I would challenge you and say that surgeons have been working at quality improvement since their beginning. As a matter of fact, as scientists, human scientists, it is in your DNA. You're inherently driven to try and thing make, trying to make things better for your patient. You've been practicing quality all of your career. You may not have recognized it, just as Pere was practicing the scientific method before anybody had defined what the scientific method was. Now there is no doubt with today's information technology that we are living in the quality era. Everything and everybody has some type of quality or quality standard or quality claim. We're bombarded with information and data. Physicians, surgeons, patients, hospitals, we are bombarded with data and information on a daily basis. The question is, is that information and data useful? Can we turn that information and data into knowledge? Albert Einstein years ago observed, and this is a fantastic quote to live by when you're looking at quality measures and quality improvement. Einstein observed, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. How do we determine what is most important? You are the individuals who can disseminate that information for us. As one of your colleagues who is here with us today, Clifford Coe observed, we need to focus quality improvement on the programs that measurably improve care, decrease burden, decrease cost, and at the end of the day, improve care for our patients. Improve care for our patients, just as Ambrose Paré was doing in the 1500s. Now, I work in a hospital system, and there are a plethora of quality measures. It's an alphabet soup. You can sit down and write 15 different acronyms for various different types of quality enhancement, quality performance measures. The question I always have is, does anyone know what these all mean? 
Has anyone taken the time to determine what are the measurably important things that we're looking at? And do we really measure quality? I think within the program that the ASC, the NSQIP, yet another an acronym, is one of those programs that's actually trying to put a face and a meaning on what quality is. Everyone seems to have their own definition, and those of us that are just patients are not sure which quality measure trumps the other quality measure. What do they mean? And without the input of individuals like you, we will never be able to discern as a patient, as a consumer of health care, what is the best quality, what is high quality. The state of Tennessee has an incredible number of measuring instruments. And as a representative of the citizens of the state, I'm frequently bombarded with these different health rating instruments to try and determine, are we making progress in the state of Tennessee? We like to think that we are, but are we making progress? How do I utilize these quality tools to ensure that we're enhancing the lives of the citizens that we represent? Now, there are a number of models that have emerged, and most of the quality improvement models have emerged out of the manufacturing industry. The manufacturing industry has struggled over the past 20 years, and the way they've survived in America is they have gotten better and better at what they do. That is no different than the surgeon in the operating room, as was alluded to in your very first speaker. Continually trying to improve the process, continually trying to find ways to be more efficient, at the same time being more effective, and at the same time produce better outcomes for your patient is how quality initiatives drive the economic side of the equation. Manufacturing figured that out a long time ago. And now healthcare, particularly in the surgical realm and in hospital care, is looking at the same model that was used in manufacturing to enhance the delivery of healthcare. Now I'm a huge fan of performance-based or results-oriented, outcomes-based type measures. I think they have great merit. They are a very effective tool. They're not all the all be all of everything, but they are certainly a great tool. And one of my favorite quotes that I use at work, I use it in the legislature as well, is from Tom Peters or Peter Drucker or William Jennings, uh, William Dennings, you can pick who you want, but says what gets measured gets done. It's the checklist that was referred to by your first speaker. What gets measured gets done. And I also like, for healthcare, and since we have some insurance folks here, what gets rewarded gets repeated. What gets measured gets done. What gets re rewarded gets repeated. The state of Tennessee has used outcome measures for a number of years, our entire budgeting process is based on performance management. All of our departments and agencies, from the Department of Health all the way down to corrections, uh, their funding is based upon how they performed relative to a set number of standards. But quality measures, quality outcomes, they may be very effective tools, but they're only effective if what we are measuring is valid and reliable. And we depend on folks like you to help us determine that. And we should always be careful and remember that we should not focus too much on cost containment and sacrifice the quality of patient care. As I close, we all realize medicine, surgery, health care in itself is part science and it's part art. And many of the stakeholders in today's healthcare system would like for us to operate like a production line. Unfortunately, as we all know, people and human physiology do not always cooperate with what the production line would like to see. Standardization has become the mantra of government insurance companies, hospitals, physicians, even the public. Yet each of us know that no two humans 
are the same. And while we can develop excellent models and excellent process, we should be mindful of what one famous economist said, and that is that all models are wrong. Some models are helpful. Healthcare, like politics, healthcare is local. It's very difficult to design a system with a scalability that can encompass everyone. As we've seen, there are differences between Tennesseans and others across this country. But these models, from NSQIP to others, can help us establish a system of health care that will be at the level of quality that we all expect it to be. And my final word to you. Scientists, physicians, rarely enjoy participating in the political process. I understand that. But you have to understand that in today's world, particularly with the Affordable Care Act and other changes that are coming to health care, if you are not at the table helping us make decisions, someone else will be at the table in your seat, and they probably will not have your best interests in mind. It is critical to us that practicing health care professionals Surgeons, physicians of all kinds need to be part of the health care discussion, need to have input into the process, because at the end of the day, as the manufacturing industry taught us, the person who knows best how to fix a process is the person who does the process on a day-to-day -day basis. And so my call to action to you is to not only to fully embrace the NSQIP and the many quality initiatives that are moving across this land, but to engage yourself in a serious conversation about how do we move health care in a positive direction in this country and in this state, and not only maintain the quality, but continually work to improve the quality. Thank you very much for your time and attention this morning. It is an honor and a privilege to be here and to hear what you have to say in our panel discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Kofer. Thank you very much, Bo. That was great. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to give you a lengthy introduction of all of our panelists because I, I, I think they're in your, your event planner you've got. Um, we're going to ask each one of the panelists to give a, a, a brief uh, comment, and then hopefully have about 30 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Our first panelist is Dr. Clifford Coe, who currently serves as the director of the American College of Surgeons Division of Research and Optimal Patient Care. We'll go down the line from him. Cliff? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coe, for... Um, Good morning, everyone. My name's Clifford Coe. I work at the uh, American College of Surgeons uh, in our quality division. I'm also an operating surgeon uh, at UCLA, a, a colorectal surgeon. And I'd like to echo uh, what the prior speakers have said, it's, is that uh, we really need to figure out at the end of the day uh, how to give bit better patient care in the context of everything that's going on uh, in, in, in our healthcare environment. And I'd just like to share with you, I only have three minutes and 17 seconds to talk, and I just took 17 of those seconds. Uh, but in the three minutes left, I'd like to share with you three, you know, very uh, uh, straightforward, simple observations uh, um, from our experience at the college uh, and, and somewhat globally, nationally. Uh, the first is that quality and safety is really a priority. And, you know, it's always been a priority. Everyone talks about, yes, quality, yes, safety, blah, 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 blah. But it's really a priority now. Even if you watched the Olympics the other day, the opening ceremony, they talked about the UK and the Industrial Revolution, but a huge part of that uh, um, uh, opening ceremony was devoted to their national health service. It, it, it is a global issue. It is definitely a national issue for us. And not just because it decreased costs and not just because it improves efficiency or uh, uh, value, uh, uh, but it really because we believe that it improves patient care. And again, it gets down to what we believe as providers of it is it improves patient care. 
the, the second observation is that as, as we work with a lot of these national folks and in, in who evaluate quality, that improving quality really needs to be data driven. We have to really show that we're improving quality. We have to know how we're doing. And the data has been discussed earlier, the data has to be rigorous. The data has to be true. The data, we have to, as a surgeon, I have to believe if somebody tells me that I have an infection issue with the patients, I have to believe that that's right. And, and up to this point, I'm not sure that we've always believed the data that comes out, and that has to continually get better. Um, at the college, we have a number of programs, and there's a lot of programs outside the college that uses good data, uses data that are clinical, that are audited, that are risk adjusted. A lot of times we as surgeons in our heritage, we like to look at outcomes. We don't always like to look at process measures or what, we like to look at outcomes. So using outcomes at the end of the day, did the patient live or not, did the patient have an infection or not, a VTE or not. That's how we're focused on our M&M conferences, what we report, when we give talks and whatnot. We really like to look at outcomes. And I think that a lot of the, the ideas and the measures coming out now from folks like CMS and ARC and all those that, are, that we are being measured on are, going to, are outcomes based and are with clinical data. We are, there's a, uh, in the federal rule coming out uh, that there is a, um, uh, uh, a mandate or, or an incentive to join clinical registries in general surgery. That is for the first time that they've done that and, and CMS has said that they believe that a, joining a registry, a clinical registry, a quality improvement program based on clinical data is really a commitment to quality. And, and NISQIP is one of those, to S STS that the thoracic surgeons um, are doing is another one of those. But those types of programs are really a commitment to quality. The third observation is, is what you all are doing here in Tennessee and that, and that the, the collaborative uh, in, 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 in surgery to improve care. Um, it really demonstrates a uh, ability to work amongst hospitals. It demonstrates the ability, uh, as Patch was saying, uh, to work within a hospital of, amongst the different providers of care. It demonstrates really how stakeholders who may or may not be able to, to, to work together previously can work together to achieve uh, a collaborative uh, to, to achieve ultimately better patient care. So I think those are just three quick observations, Dr. Kofer, that, uh, that really quality and safety is, is key and, and, that, um, and that locally working together is, is going to achieve that. So thank, thank you, you, Cliff. Uh, well said. Our next speaker is perhaps the glue that holds this collaborative together. Uh, she's been instrumental in its formation. She does the lion's share of all the work that gets done. Chris Clark is a nurse and she's a senior vice president with the Tennessee Hospital Association. Chris? Thank you, Dr. Cover. Um, from the hospital association perspective, um, we are delighted to be a part of this collaborative in Tennessee for surgery. And it builds on the work we have already established through the safety center at THA. The hospital association has worked on a number of initiatives and um, looked at culture and as an integral part of that quality improvement in our earlier work on infections. So when we had the opportunity to partner with the Tennessee College and the, um, American College of Surgeons to create the surgical collaborative here in Tennessee with Blue Cross, it was a perfect fit and made um, um, absolute sense for us to utilize the infrastructure that we had through the hospital association. We have a tremendous commitment from our board of directors and from our senior team um, our CEO, Craig Becker, who couldn't be here today, in particular, has been a driving force in saying we, as an association, quality and safety are one of our pillars um, for action. And I think we, we fit the opportunity to coordinate simply because we are a neutral party um, and had a history of convening. So I think from a local perspective, what the association has brought to it and where we continue to see opportunity to work with the college is in the fact that we, um, as a hospital association membership, we can bring the senior leaders and the CEOs to the table. And I think oftentimes, even within our own institutions, there's a, there's a sense that, of, of feeling that um, there's a disconnect somehow between the C-suite and the surgeons. And collaboratives such as this bring together those opportunities to have those conversations and to align those priorities in, in the organization um, as they go forward. The other benefit, I think, to the local aspect of collaboration is bringing bringing together a peer group. And um, the NISCIP program utilizes um, surgical clinical reviewers, most of them nurses, who are the, the glue to the program that do the chart abstraction. 
um, and collect the data. And through our collaborative and our networking meetings, we bring together the nurses and the surgeons and the quality directors all together four times a year to really take a look at the data. Because as others have pointed out, data, is, data and information is um, rich, but until you have the ability to discuss it and act on it, it's simply data. So we try to take data and put it into action um, and help people see where those opportunities are. So I think from our perspective, that, that's the glue or the most important part around having a local opportunity for collaboration and a safe place for those discussions to occur. Um, we've been able to look at this from a non-competitive standpoint and say all of us desire the same things for quality improvement and by convening our collective groups, we have a safe place for those discussions to occur and a much um, more robust opportunity to look at those improvements. Thank you, Chris. So we've heard from Chris, who's really sort of the glue that holds this whole thing together. Next, we're going to hear from Vicki Gregg. I've known Vicki since 73, 74. We actually were in college together before I got into medical school. Then she was a nurse in the hospital where I was a surgery resident. She went on to have a, a stellar career uh, nationally. She's the uh, CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield here in Chattanooga. And quite frankly, if it wasn't for her vision, and the forward thinking of herself and the people in her organization, we wouldn't be here. So, uh, Vicki, let me thank you sincerely for all that you've done for us, and uh, I'd like to ask you to say a few words. Thanks, Joe, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today, an honor to be part of this panel. You know, whenever I'm with Joe, I always remember that cat back in anatomy. <laughs> Uh, we were actually lab partners, and I would not have made it through anatomy without Joe. He, he really worked that cat over. <laughs> but we got a good grade, so that was the good news. You know, people frequently think of companies like ours as uh, one that simply pays claims, but I can tell you that that really is very far from reality for our health plan today. We really do see our mission as improving the health of the populations that we serve, improving the quality of life for each and every member, and assuring access to affordable, quality, high uh, health care. That broad mission really led our leadership, including our board of directors, to begin thinking about how we could best address those needs, really uh, around 2003, which is when I became CEO. One of the important outcomes of that discussion has really been the unprecedented partnership with employers, with patients, with hospitals, with physicians to address issues around health status and patient safety and quality and also workforce development. Now, I think we all know that it's not unusual for organizations to talk about mission, but the proof is really in the results, what happens the outcomes that are truly measurable and meaningful to people. And it was with this in mind that our board actually set some long-term go uh, goals for our organization and actually tied financial incentives for our leadership team to, to achieve some specific goals, including improving health status. And we measure that by looking at things like the percent of the population that is obese, smoking, has hypertension, blood, uh, high blood sugar, and high cholesterol. The percentage of people that receive appropriate preventative care as measured through the HEDIST uh, metrics. Reductions in infant morbidity and mortality in our state. Uh, workforce development, and then also what brings us here today to lower the incidence of hospital-acquired infections and resulting harm to patients. So these have been goals that we've been talking about for a number of years, almost 10 years now. Now, we were a very smart group of people. We figured out that this was something that we couldn't do just within our organization, that it would really require a collaborative effort with many people across the state and that we would need to partner with others. And frankly, the Tennessee College of Surgeons uh, stepped up with leadership and commitment to make some things happen in the area of surgical infections. 
We also worked and had the assistance of the uh, Tennessee uh, Center for Patient Safety and Quality, which had been established by the THA. And what a wonderful thing for these efforts to be able to come together to really benefit patients across our state. Uh, some of you know that I began my health uh, care career as a nurse. And interestingly, uh, almost 30 years ago, was moved into the area of what was then called quality assurance. It kind of tells you how old I am. I can tell you uh, from those lessons that understanding how to measure and improve quality was very much in its infancy at that time. But one of the early lessons for me was the power of data and information to change how physicians, nurses, other clinicians actually practiced and took care of patients. The most important part that I saw of providing that data was that the people who were involved in it really trusted the data. Because if they don't trust the information, if they don't trust the data, they're not going to change. They're not going to react to it. And I believe that that is really one of the key strengths of NISQIP. There's clinical data, it's risk adjusted, it's presented in constructive ways that's improving outcomes for patients. Let me just say that we are really proud to be part of this collaborative and we really do look forward to working together both now but also in the long term future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicki. And again, let me thank you personally from the collaborative for your support. Our next panelist is Will Gibson. I've uh, known Will a long time. Will is a member of the leadership committee of the collaborative. He's also a practicing general surgeon at Park West Hospital in Knoxville. Will, your comments? Thanks, Joe. Um, as Joe said, I'm, I'm a practicing surgeon, proud to be a member of a group called Premier Surgical Associates in Knoxville. I do my work in a single hospital called Park West, which is a community hospital. Um, I've been involved in NISQIP since 2008. I was originally uh, brought into this by my dear friend, Dr. Hines, who's here, and he and I have continued our conversations uh, frequently over the last few years. And um, I've had the privilege of working intimately with this collaborative, and uh, I've learned a tremendous amount. And, and over that time, two things from, from my role, again, my role as a private practicing guy in one uh, community hospital, two things have come to the forefront of my mind. That, that I'm working on, and that is transparency of data to, to individual surgeons. And by transparency, I mean individual surgeon outcomes being reported to individual surgeons. And uh, that's an inflammatory process, I realize. I'm, I'm a party to that as well. There's potential threat there to each of us. Uh, it's it's, it's a, an alarming thought. But my observations through NISQIP over the last few years have shown me that um, data is appearing and being presented to us from outside sources that we may or may not trust in terms of their validity and how they uh, achieved these conclusions. Um, and uh, NISQIP at its, at its uh, foundation is managed and owned by surgeons and it's data that we aim to use and to create and to use as, as data that we trust as an armamentarium perhaps against the data that's being presented to us that we don't trust as much. The, the other factor in transparency and in individual reporting is that, uh, I gotta repeat what Speaker Watson said earlier about each one of us as surgeons in our hearts and in our cores, um, we like what we do and we are competitive and we want to do it better. So one thing that has become clear to me in watching this develop and watching surgeons be presented with their data, uh, it, it almost always brings about some sort of denial and some sort of inflammatory response in the short term. But then each one of us, when left to, to ponder what, whatever it was presented to us, whether we think it's completely wrong or partially correct, each one of us wants to do better. And so I think that transparency is an important factor in, in moving the needle uh, toward better outcomes because it, when left to our own devices and, and uh, given time to ponder our own data, we all will find ways to make it better and the collective result of that will be better outcomes for patients. My second observation and my second goal is in my own role in NISQIP and in quality improvement 
is improving relations and creating better partnerships with hospital administrators. And in the community hospital setting, there's been a long uh, history of, of some antagonism between medical staff and administrators. So that varies from place to place. It's not present everywhere, but there, there is, we all know, some, some antagonism. And that is, is going to be uh, suicidal, or it's cannibalistic to both sides as time goes on. And uh, more scrutiny and more pressure develops from outside sources to improve outcomes and to cut costs. We, as clinicians, have skills and knowledge that the administrators need, and the administrators have knowledge and tools and resources that we need. And the old age of antagonism needs to be put behind us, and we've got to work together. And, and this data that we use through NISQIP is an important tool in achieving that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Well said. Um, our next panelist is also a member of the Leadership Committee of the Collaborative. Oscar Gillamandigi is a practicing trauma EGS critical care surgeon, associate professor of surgery at Vanderbilt University. Oscar. Thanks, Dr. Kofer. Um, first of all, I, I have to make note of the fact that uh, under Dr. Kofer's leadership, this uh, quality collaborative has really, I think, opened the eyes of Tennesseans and even at the national level, an incredible collaboration between uh, uh, academic and uh, non-academic surgeons. And as we know, 80% of the fellows of the American College Surgeon, most of the physicians in the world aren't academics. And I think this brings together a really uh, tight-knit group of both academic and community intellect to bring about change um, in, in surgical and in hospital care. I think we as academicians live in a in silos and have always believed that our data was the best. And one thing that I love about NISQIP is that you can take national numbers, or in our case, the Tennessee Collaborative, take local numbers and crush some of the biased data and opinion that has been out there in the past. And that anachronistic, uh, biased scientific uh, level of care can become uh, reality of, of large numbers and, and large data set of, of good quality data that we produce here. I think NISQIP affords a global uh, change that might not have been realized without it. And then if you take it to the next level, what has been discussed across the, the platform here is that it, it's not just about the surgeon, but it's a multidisciplinary uh, uh, care that gets down to the level of every single person that has a, a viable interest in every single patient in the institution. And, and it can bring to light not just the, what I do that can be changed, but what we do as a group to make better each individual patient's care. And that system, system approach is, is what we should be striving for not just in, in surgery, but in medicine as a whole. And one of the wonderful things about working with, with uh, Will and, and many of the surgeons in our, our collaborative is that that intellect is, is more, I mean, there's no difference between what Will knows and what I know, it's just where we are that we're bringing that about. So it brings a greater voice to, to affect change, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that, and I think this, the Tennessee Surgical Quality Collaborative has done a great job to kind of show that nationally. Thank you, Oscar. And our final panelist is Mr. David Archer. Uh, Mr. Archer had the wisdom and foresight to get into NSQIP way back in 06 before we had the collaborative under the leadership of Leonard Hines, who was at St. Francis at the time. So, uh, Mr. Archer, your thoughts? Thank you. Uh, I sympathize with uh, Senator Watson uh, in feeling a little out of place today at a hospital CEO speaking to a group of the American College of Surgeons, reminding me of about three weeks ago, our oldest son was married, got married in Washington, D.C. At, at the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament and driving back and forth a hundred times to the airport to pick up relatives and whomever. Uh, I kept driving by, or I, I first noticed I drove by the St. Patrick's Episcopal Church. And I thought, 
you know, that makes about as much sense as the Martin Luther Catholic Church. Um, so just imagine me, I'm, I'm Martin Luther up here speaking before the College of Cardinals. Um, our, let me give you, I guess I'll give you the benefit of a little bit of our experience uh, with NISQIP, somewhat as an early adopter, but, um, and, and for those of you there in hospitals that have not adopted NISQIP, uh, maybe some lessons learned. Number one, early on, we're, in hospitals we're good at creating silos to put things in, and usually those silos are tall and and they kind of like like the things you put grain in. But but Nisquip, we put Nisquip in a silo that was you know it was it was a ballistic missile silo up in Minot, North Dakota, you know, 50 feet underground. Um, and the reason being is much like we, we did the same thing when we instituted ACS with the cardiologists, was to get surgeons to contribute their data and information from their offices, the things we needed, we felt like uh, we really, 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 really had to protect the data. And so, but, but a, a byproduct of that is it even today is not well integrated into our other quality processes within the hospital, our overall quality systems. And the people that run those quality systems are responsible for those, um, you know, didn't know a lot about NISQIP. It was a little bit hidden from them at the beginning. And they are also under the pressure of all of the things that are publicly reported about our hospitals all of the things that we now get paid or penalized for. And sometimes those things can take a little higher priority than something that they didn't have a lot to do with the beginning of. So that would, would be number one. Number two would be consistency and leadership. Um, we've had some changes in terms of our abstractors, but most importantly in terms of the surgeon champion. Dr. Hines brought it to the table and when you're when your chief of staff and, and a surgeon of the caliber of, of Leonard Hines comes to the hospital CEO and says, I want to do X and it'll cost Y, you say, yes, sir, generally, uh, as a good hospital CEO. But unfortunately, uh, you know, a little bit down the road, Dr. Hines decided to go back to whatever God's country is. I don't know what that means, but, but decided to make that transition. Um, and so we spent tremendous resources educating Dr. Will Gibson and NISQIP and, and training him in leadership and those kind of things. And he decided to go, I don't know, to rural Tennessee somewhere to practice uh, after that. So another hospital has benefited from all of that investment. Unfortunately, now we have Dr. Norma Edwards, who uh, another uh, outstanding product of, 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 a, of the big orange training machine. Uh, who's leading the process. But those changes and tra those transitions um, have set us back in terms of that adoption. Uh, and, and in a lot of ways, I think, you know, through those surgeons' leadership um, and, and likely, you know, largely, we've, we've almost in some senses stumbled upon the improvements that we've made. It's not been in a, a highly organized fashion. And then I guess the final point is um, about the usual suspects. Um, you know, the usual suspects can pull off the, the greatest heist and the greatest con and they can run the medical staff and, and deal with policy issues on a medical staff uh, and do great peer review, but they can't make NISQIP work. Uh, NISQIP requires the rank and file surgeons within the hospital, those that are quote, too busy to be involved in quality improvement, uh, to get involved. And if you don't, it won't work. It won't have an impact. It can't be led, it can't be done by the leadership, by the usual suspects. You have to come together as surgeons and decide what you're going to improve, what you're going to focus on, and, what, and, and measure that and achieve that. So with that, back to Dr. Cooper. Well, let me thank all the panelists for such superb and insightful comments, and especially on superb time management. You've done a great job. Uh, so we have, we're going to open this up to the floor for some questions and answers. We've got about 25 minutes, according to my script here. Um, 
we have people in the room with microphones, so if you have a question, if you'll please hold up your hand, they'll bring you the microphone. And I would like to ask all of the uh, people asking questions to be succinct and limit your questions to one minute or less, please. So, yes, ma'am? Anybody have any questions? You hear me? My name is Rick Miller. I'm the chief of trauma at Vanderbilt. And um, I think this collaborative is awesome, but it's a collaborative amongst healthcare providers. Um, I think we have a real problem in Tennessee, one with morbid obesity, two with smoking, and three with diabetes. And so with this great panel here, I'd like to hear everyone's um, opinions on how we should contract with our patients in order to get better outcomes. We want to have good outcomes. Our patients want to have good outcomes. I do a lot of complex abdominal wall reconstructions and actually won't operate electively on these patients until they stop smoking and lose some weight. So where do we stand in our state in trying to encourage our patients to have better outcomes as well? Speaker Watson, you want to take a stab at that? Can you legislate uh, good health? <laughs> Well, some folks in some states are doing that. Uh, I don't think that will happen in Tennessee. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. Let's look in the mirror and look at, at Tennesseans. Uh, we're a state where approximately 23% of our population has a bachelor's degree. We live in a state where about 80 to 85% of our population has a high school diploma. Tennessee is struggling with many of the cultural problems that many of the deep southern states have in that we have not adequately valued education. And if you look at a myriad of studies, myriad of studies across all spectrums, whether it's health care, economic development, pick your poison. The educational attainment, the educational level of your citizens is critical to advancing and improving in those areas. And so fundamentally, Tennessee is, and I believe we're on the path of a cultural shift where we start to value education. Once we value education and once we have more citizens with high school diplomas, more, more citizens with college uh, degrees, then they will have a better understanding of some of these very issues that are alluded to. Because if you were to look at that cohort, you would find that amongst that cohort, the highest percentage of folks who have those problems tend to have lower educational attainment. And so much of our health changes cannot be achieved through lecture or through advertising or through marketing promotions. It has to be achieved at the fundamental level, which is changing the individual. And in this great country, the one way we change individuals is by providing them, as Thomas Jefferson would believe, providing them with the best education we possibly can. And I think Tennessee is, with all our reform changes in education, we are moving in that direction. Thank you. Uh, Vicki? Uh, this is an area that we've really tried to focus, uh, particularly with our employers across the state. You know, several years ago, we looked at the health status of the population in Tennessee and, and really bemoaned, look, you know, look at what we're dealing with. And then we measured uh, some of the metrics for our own employee population. And lo and behold, we found out that the Blue Cross Blue Shield employee population was actually less healthy than the population at large. So uh, that sort of told us we needed to start at home. We, we did a number of things in terms of trying to provide incentives uh, for employees as well as to create an environment that really does support um, sort of healthy lifestyles. Uh, we've begun to look now at our smoking rate, for example. When we started, uh, we had about 25% of our population, our employee population that smoked. We're now down to 8%. And we think a lot of that was driven by the fact that we became a smoke-free campus, as well as having incentives around our health insurance where you have a different rate if you smoke or not. As it relates to obesity, this has been one of the tougher ones, but um, we actually pay employees to walk. Um, they can earn up to $250 a quarter 
based on how many uh, steps they take. We have other programs they can participate and also earn that money. And last year we had, I believe it was 15 employees that lost in excess of 100 pounds. So uh, some, some significant movement. And we look at our overall population and see that. We've had drops now in the percent of people who are hypertensive, who are diabetic. Type 2 diabetes has actually declined in our population over time. And uh, we have also uh, lowered the incidence of high cholesterol. Uh, we're seeing that now in our health care costs. And we're beginning to take those programs out across the state with our employees um, that we insure uh, and really try to push these programs and get people to engage in this. What I can tell you is that these kinds of efforts can't be punitive. They have to be something that people ultimately see as being in their own best benefit. And initially, um, I took a few licks uh, in terms of people who thought some of the things that we did were pretty radical. But I can also tell you that the number of people that came up to me and said, I had no idea I was hypertensive. I had no idea that I was diabetic. I have you know, been able to reverse that. My own assistant has lost a, a significant amount of weight. She also lowered her cholesterol, triglycerides, and really lowered her overall health risk and uh, much healthier today. But I think it is a very active, proactive kind of thing. It's an environment that we have to create where we support each other and uh, we, you know, we can't just continue in the way we have in the past. A great, great solution, Vicki. Oscar? One last uh, comment. Uh, Dr. Miller, be careful what you wish for. Two cents on every one of those packs of cigarettes goes towards the trauma fund for unfunded care. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it currently sits at about $10 million a year. <laughs> Tony? I've got a couple of questions. One for Dr. Coe. We would like to see risk-adjusted data for the individual surgeons. Is that anywhere in the future? Yes, yeah, so um, as everyone knows, I think that NISQIP is a facility hospital-based program. Within, within NISQIP, however, there's the opportunity to put individual surgeons there, and so right now folks can get uh, individual surgeon data. We are in the back rooms of the college with our statisticians trying to work on that, and so um, I'm not sure how it's going to turn out. We, you know, part of what we want to produce uh, before we release anything is that it has to be rigorous and responsible. And uh, we're still working on making it those things uh, before we release it, but we are headed in, trying to head in that direction. Yes, sir. And Ms. Gregg, is there any plans for Blue Cross to incentivize hospitals? You guys have done great giving, uh, giving us the, the seed money to get started. Now as we transform and as some of the older hospitals move out and as you give money to the new hospitals to get them started, is there any incentive plan for hospitals uh, like they do in Michigan? I think there's like a 2% increase in reimbursement for hospitals that participate in NISQIP. Is there, it doesn't matter to me if you use a carrot or a whip, but... <laughs> I, I think that the hospitals are going to need some incentive to keep to stay in the program and continue. There's a lot of different quality initiatives out there, and each hospital thinks, I'm afraid we've been putting that back silo also in our hospital. So I think it's got yeah, to be and, and we would agree with you in terms of trying to really reward quality and overall value in healthcare. And there are a number of demonstrations um, that we have going on across the state right now that actually do have quality um, metrics and rewards for those quality metrics. The patient-centered medical homes where we're really right now focusing on some of the chronic conditions, trying to reduce readmission rates as an example are some of the things that we're doing. We have a, a very new bundled payment for orthopedics, for hips and knees, that essentially has some quality metrics in it as well in terms of rewards. Uh, we also have a number of conversations and uh, probably soon to be announced uh, accountable care organization type arrangements where there are quality uh, incentives and metrics there as well. So there's a lot of progressive thought there. I think if you all have ideas about how to do that, 
there's a lot of receptivity within our organization to looking at those. I, I've just found that, you know, when we sit in a room and try to think this stuff up, it doesn't work very well. And uh, where we can get around a table and really talk with the clinicians, physicians, the hospitals about how to make this work and how to make people feel like this is something that really truly is rewarding them for good work is, is a better approach. So any ideas, uh, we're, we're certainly open. David? Just a, a, an add on to that, I guess I'd rather see, you know, enhanced reimbursement for the surgeons that are actually involved rather than the hospitals. Um, and, and it would, in that case, we would, you could drag the hospitals kicking and screaming rather than us dragging you sometimes because we're the ones getting the benefit or, or the, the pain um, while it doesn't affect physicians, surgeons, whomever. I think it would be much better for the surgeons to be the ones that get the benefit from it. Other questions? Let me, uh, I'm sorry, yes. Can I have a question? Yes, sir. Um, I was at the Salt Lake NISQIP meeting, and I think one thing that was talked about was how this needs to spread to be more effective. Um, and I would think that it's easy to see that we are getting toward uh, somewhat scientific risk-adjusted data, which is probably better than a lot of data. But there are other things that drive hospitals uh, and hospital systems to spend money looking at quality. Being on the board of an eight hospital system, uh, I see a tremendous amount of time spent dealing with SCIP data, HCAPS data. Uh, we know SCIP data probably doesn't correlate very well with outcomes. Uh, and then we recently now with Will's hospital, who's in the same system, and my hospital, we have the grand total of two out of the eight hospitals in that system involved in the NISQIP program. Um, granted, they are the two larger hospitals in the system. From Ms. Clark's opinion, uh, involvement as a hospital association vice president, and Mr. Archer as an administrator of a large hospital system, do you feel that NISQIP can gain traction uh, do you feel that it will, it, it does have the power to do things, and can it be supported by the administrators and CEOs of these hospital systems to uh, go forth? I mean, it's only about general surgery and some of the other surgical specialties, but it, there is a doubt, you know, it sort of, the water flows over the edge and will impact other specialties as general surgery does certain things to uh, improve itself. Chris, do you want to take a stab at that to start with? I'll, I'll be happy to. Um, I think it has the power to be, um, to continue and to be seen. I think as others have pointed out, it, it's clinically rich data, it's risk adjusted, and it's your data as surgeons created by your college. So as surgeons and then the nurses that are involved in the program as well, it's only as good as the, as the, informa as the actions you take from it. So if you believe in it and you're willing to say, this is information we think is valid and actionable, and here's where we see the opportunity and what to do with it, you'll create your own value equation. I think we have learned that um, the other key to success is don't let it sit in a silo, as others have said. You've got to integrate it and align it. You have other people in your hospital and other systems and resources through quality and infection control and other departments. And the richness of the clinical data that you get from NISQIP combined with the NHSN data and the other data is really where the opportunity lies. But if you don't align it and you don't help um, as surgeons and nursing um, surgical leaders, if you don't help your organization see what is included in that data set and how it can work with your publicly reported requirements or your other data to get outcomes, then, then you are at more risk. But we've seen those that I think that it will align it and use it fully, it will continue, and it has great power. David, any comments? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd probably the same comments I made earlier. I mean, I, I think, you know, I can get it maybe out of the silos. Um, uh, you know, there's only, you know, there's limitations to hospital leaders, and most of us have 
a lot of limitations. But we can get it out of the silos, but I guess I would again say, uh, you know, you're one of the usual suspects. Um, I am sure at your hospital, you're one of the people that has been involved in leadership for a long time, has been on every committee, has led every committee and, and those kinds of things. And, and that would be the other, that's really the challenge is it's got to get beyond you. Uh, it's got to get and catch fire with all of the surgeons in the hospital. Uh, and it, it is, it's a great model, you know, like uh, STS like ACC, it's it's relevant. Uh, you know, it's real data, um, and and it's not claims based, and it's not coding based, and it doesn't have all the limitations those things have. Uh, and at the end of the day, from a hospital's perspective, it's it you know it's maybe a little bit more cost costly than those programs that are based on coding data and those kind of things, not, but not much. Uh, and it's vastly superior data. David, before I move to Cliff, he wants to make a comment. <clears throat> Real quickly, can you very quickly tell us what you think, uh, as a hospital CEO, what you need to say to your peers that aren't in on the inside to get them on the inside? What, what type of conversation would you have with your a uh, compatriot in a small R hospital that's not in this quip. Well, I, I think, you know, again, I think number one is that, 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 you know, in terms of what you invest in SCIP or what you invest in, uh, you know, measuring pneumonia performance, those kind of things, it isn't terribly much more expensive than that. Um, and, and, but number two is the, the, the data and, and that it is surgeon run and surgeon developed um, can really break down a lot of the barriers uh, that exist in terms of acceptance of skip measures and those kinds of things. So, I, to me, that's the thing. And, and I, you know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of it is, um, you know, Chris does a fantastic job. The association does a fantastic job. But my guess would be that probably most of the CEOs that uh, in hospitals where it hasn't been adopted don't know what it is and haven't really been, you know, introduced to it. And that's a factor of what anybody in the audience here deals with every day. There's 10 things to do for the time of doing one thing. Um, we all have so much on our plates that it doesn't hit the radar screen. Cliff, I think you want to make a comment, and then Oscar. Sure, I just wanted to mention a couple things that, uh, that we here at the college from a lot of folks. One is alignment. Uh, if we could align, uh, if we could align a lot of the regulatory things that we have to do or incentivize to do, which turns out we have to do, um, and the clinical things that we want to do, if we could align those quality things together, that would be terrific. But, uh, you know, we hear a lot that why are we doing this and this and this, and hospitals have to do literally thousands of things amongst all the different pairs, all these boxes that we have to check. But what if, the, what, what, what if some of those boxes that we have to check actually help us take care of patients better? Mm -hmm. So if we can align those things, that would be terrific. The work that we try to do at the college is to, to work with the, the folks who develop those regulatory things to say that, all right, can we align these things so that it really helps us? We think that, you know, if we look at our outcomes, for example, if we look at our surgical site infection, our rate of our infection, rather than whether I put a warmer on a patient, and it's not even plugged in, but if I put the warmer on, I get that box checked. Or if I use that clipper thing or whatnot. But if we know what our, our rate of infection is, that would be much better. And we've worked with CMS to put that through, got it endorsed by the NQF. They said, all right, go work with the CDC because they have their system. Can we harmonize those things uh, so that you, we just have to do one thing and we get a checkbox, but it actually helps us give care. Alignment is gonna be key and we're absolutely working towards that. The other thing is that what was mentioned earlier is communication, that letting other folks know that, you know, maybe there is a better way of doing it and you have it here in the collaborative, but other folks, not in the collaborative or other folks not in Tennessee and even other specialties. We are starting to hear a lot more from other specialties. Dr. Hoyt hears a lot as well. We were just on a call with the transplant surgeons. Even thoracic surgeons uh, uh, are asking, can we add some stuff into this program and whatnot? So, so it is getting out there amongst not just general vascular, but uh, other specialties as well. And as, as you know, if you're in the procedure target, there's 
every specialty, gynecology, urology, pediatric surgery or whatnot, going across the board because we, we see that it works in general and vascular with you know, things like the Tennessee Collaborative and, and we wanna use what works and, and spread it. And so that's to other specialties, that's to other hospital settings, that's to other, uh, other types of care, so. Oscar, some quick comments? Just a quick one, you know, if you really think about it, it allows a voice to each surgeon out there, whether in a big center or a small center. And if we're, it, my belief is that the more surgeons that believe they're the greatest operative surgeon in the world, the, the better the outcomes are going to be if we can collect all those data points from all those places where people believe they're doing the best work. It gives the smaller community hospital guys as much of a voice on that data set to put their O to E together and, and come up with good outcomes, which could then be the, the benchmark for uh, our group to come and visit and see how it's done that makes it better. Secondly, that voice then transfers to the subspecialties and you get this desire to take these unique populations of patients, whether they be in the otorhinolaryngological otorhinolaryngological groups or, you know, neurosurgeons or whatever, but the populations are different and they also need to have uh, their own set of, of uh, uh, kind of uh, rate, you know, set uh, ODEs based upon their populations. And I think that's another unique aspect that the, the target specific and uh, some of the smaller rural uh, initiatives take into account. Joe, can I say something? Sure, speak Watson. Yeah, just from an outsider's observation, um, you know, if you're going to ingrain a quality culture like NISQIP or pick your quality measure, but if you're going to ingrain it in your operations, physicians, surgeons are huge customers to hospitals. But programs like this don't work when they are top down. They have to be bubble up from the bottom up. That is, the customers who are using the services of the hospital in this instance, surgeons, need to make this a priority, an imperative to them within the hospital that they operate. And by bubbling up from a bottom-up perspective rather than a top-down perspective, you have a better chance of ingraining a quality system, a quality performance system within the culture of a hospital, within a culture of a profession. And so I would encourage you to as you go back to your individual hospitals or hospital systems, that you try to use a strategy of using this from the customer's perspective that utilize the hospital and bubble it up to administration and to leadership rather than having leadership tell people what to do, which inevitably leads to people not doing what leadership is telling them to do. <laughs> yes. Well, at, at this point, Amen. I'd like to conclude the Q&A portion of this. Um, I'd like to really thank the panelists for their participation. Can I have uh, David, could David Hoyt join us? And uh, Chris is already up here. And while David's on his way up here, I'd just like to say on behalf of the American College of Surgeons, the Tennessee chapter of the American College of Surgeons, and the Tennessee Hospital Association, we'd really like to recognize and thank Vicki Gregg CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield, her dedication to health care and quality improvement. Her leadership, advocacy, support has enabled the TSQC to become an effective model for how health care, health plans, hospitals, and physicians work together to improve care. Dr. Hoyt, you want to say a few words? Well, I would just like to add my congratulations to all of you and your commitment the quality. I think the Tennessee Collaborative has really become the poster child nationally. And I want to, in, in, in addition, really emphasize what Dr. Kofer just said and thank you for your efforts in helping make this successful. And we really want to honor you on, on behalf of the college and the Tennessee Collaborative for the, the efforts that you, but also your colleagues, have done in making this successful. Chris, can you join us? Vicki? On behalf of the Tennessee State Chapter and the National Chapter, we'd like to present you with this uh, recognition of all you've done for us. Thank Thanks. you. You're welcome. It's 
rare that I'm speechless. Uh, but thank you so much. But more importantly, thank you to the people in this room who really make it happen. You are the ones who take care of those patients each and every day. You're the ones that get those better outcomes and create better lives. Thank you. That concludes our session.